Australia's thylacine, or Tasmanian tiger, is one of the most exotic and mysterious creatures to have roamed the planet. It's an incredibly amazing, beautiful marsupial that was brutally hunted by humans to extinction. But now a world first. This will be the, the foundation of bringing the thylacine back. A team of Australian scientists, in collaboration with a US genetic engineering company, are promising to resurrect it. So possibly in the next five years. I think that's a really good assessment. Their ultimate goal, to return it to its native environment. It was the only marsupial apex predator. Bringing that animal back would have incredible benefits from the ecosystem. But the $15 million project is already sparking fierce debate. So many species in Australia are threatened with extinction. To spend a lot of money doing something that is unfeasible is a missed opportunity. If they succeed, it will be a freak show. The animals will be so valuable. There's no way you can let them free range. 101 East travels to what was once thylacine heartland and talks to the scientists and their critics about the ambitious project to bring it back to life. Australia's spectacular Southern Isle was once home to the iconic thylacine. Having disappeared from Papua New Guinea and the mainland around 2,000 years ago, its fate in Tasmania was sealed by 19th century British colonists. The island's top predator shot to extinction. Here they brought this European predator, Hysteria. Everything with big teeth or claws was non grata. It was a very grim story. Biologist, conservationist, and arguably Tasmania's leading thylacine expert, Nick Mooney, is blunt about his state's shameful past. As the colony settled in and sheep arrived, the conflict started immediately. At one stage, there was a claim that more sheep were killed every year than were actually sheep in Tasmania. It was just classic tabloid rubbish. So the bounty was installed, and that really was the death knell of the thylacine. The thylacine population was wiped out within little more than a century after British colonists arrived. The last ones believed to have died here at Bomaris Zoo in Hobart in 1936. It's said to have died of neglect and exposure. Tragically, just a couple of months after its death, the thylacine was declared a protected species. This famous footage of what's considered the second last surviving thylacine was taken soon after it was captured and brought to the zoo. The haunting images have made the animal an icon of human-induced extinctions, but its spirit lives on. Reports in recent weeks have revived hopes that a few of them still survive out there somewhere in the remote mountain and forest areas. But the sad fact is, there's been no... There's been thousands of sighting reports. I've met many people who firmly believe they've seen thylacines. Um, they're absolutely convincing, but whether they did or not is a completely different issue. Almost 50 years after the last one was thought to have died, Mooney led a year-long government search for the thylacine from this site. A fellow wildlife officer had reported seeing one here. He was sleeping in his land cruiser, woke up, flicked his spotlight around and bingo. He said, there's this thylacine standing only three or four metres away from the vehicle. So he had a chance to have a really good look at it. Several minutes, he thought. When the animal disappeared, he had a look for footprints, but it was raining, so nothing. Mooney's search also found nothing. It was someone very experienced and so you got no chance of a mistake there. Yeah. And so he was either right or he was lying. He hasn't budged from his story one scrap since. Is it possible that they lived longer than people? Oh, absolutely. Think? I think it's the most extraordinary bit of human arrogance to think we caught or killed the last one. Sadly, the Tasmanian tiger has gone. This is the only film in existence of the rare creature that couldn't keep pace with man. <laughs> 
Known colloquially as the Tasmanian Tiger, or Tassie Tiger for short, the thylacine is indelibly etched in Tasmania's identity, adorning number plates and attracting tourists, small towns trading on it. In 1984, Mole Creek was the site of the last official search for the thylacine, but I'm on my way to meet some locals who say they've seen it since then and believe it's still out there. With the head of a dog, pouch of a kangaroo and stripes of a tiger, the magic of the mysterious marsupial is not lost on local publican Doug Westbrook, who took over the hotel 14 years ago. The second week he was here, we had a group of German backpackers come through and they were really keen on the thylacine. And I thought, wow, they come all the way from Germany to Mole Creek. And I thought, there's something in this. And like many of his patrons, he says... I believe I saw one. Yeah. My wife will say she definitely saw it. I've had several encounters. For old-timers like Joe and Lexi, memories of the tiger haven't faded. Well, my father used to snare back in the mountains and he used to often talk about the Tasmanian tigers. I used to torment my mother. I'd say, um, there's a Tasmanian tiger on the road. Oh, yes, another one. Well, this day I said, there's a Tasmanian tiger on the road. The closer I got, the more I could see that it really was. Though he was wet, you could still see the black stripes of him. A younger enthusiast says he's not only seen one... It just shot out of the bush, straight across in front of us and to the other side. But as video evidence... We put the camera where the tiger went in through daytime and a couple of nights later he come back out to see it rise up there. Oh, that's it? Yeah. Just there? Yeah. Not this? No, not that. Ah. That's his tail. But alas, it's hard to see anything. Unfortunately... We had the camera too high. Yeah. Social media abounds with blurry photographs and videos posted by tiger hunters claiming to have captured images of the elusive creature. While experts rebuff them, the true believers are not deterred. Yes, I'd say it probably is still around. Scientists don't know everything, and I'm certain that there's... All my mates condemn me for it, but I, I still reckon they're out there. This is an important job. The Tassie Tiger has also bewitched Hollywood. Most believers extinct. And hard-headed media barons. America's Ted Turner offered a $100,000 reward to anyone who found one. And Australia's Kerry Packer upped the ante to more than a million dollars, all to no avail. But now an American genetic engineering company is vowing to reverse the course of thylacine history. The vast mammoth step of the Pleistocene era. In late 2021, Colossal announced a project to attempt what humans have never done, bring back an extinct animal. Woolly mammoths, now long extinct, once roamed these northern landscapes in large herds. Raising more than $75 million on the back of a proposal to resurrect the woolly mammoth by editing the genome of an Asian elephant to create its giant furry relative. Breakthrough genetic engineering technologies have made it possible to read, edit, and even write genomes. Colossal. The company's catchphrase, restoring the past for a better future, is now being used to promote the de extinction of Australia's thylacine. Colossal's founder and CEO, Ben Lamb, is streaming in from Dallas, Texas. The thylacine was actually eradicated 100% by humankind, and it served a major purpose in its ecosystem. So uh, it, it's kind of this uh, perfect project where we can, uh, you know, undo what was done from the past. Huge, huge news coming out of Australia today. With the help huge, of social media influencers, Colossal are planning to de-extinct the thylacine. To learn more, go to Colossal.com. Colossal secured more than $10 million. Its investors include a movie megastar, media celebrities, private conservation companies, and US intelligence agency, the CIA. I think that, you know, the federal government, you know, wants to understand what the capabilities are around these technologies. 
where do we need to put boundaries around these technologies? And then how can these technologies really help the world, right? To really understand this ambitious project, you need to meet this man, Andrew Pask, a professor in the Bioscience Department at Australia's University of Melbourne, who's been studying thylacine development for 20 years. He leads a team of scientists collaborating with Colossal. I think there is nothing that approaches the, the, the incredibleness of the Tasmanian tiger. It was the only marsupial apex predator that has lived into modern times. And so I got really fascinated in trying to figure out, you know, this has tragically lost this species, but quite recently. And could we use museum specimens to unlock more about the biology of this incredible animal? We know that DNA breaks down over time. So for example, there is no DNA left in dinosaur bones. So the first thing was just trying to figure out, is there DNA in those specimens? Melbourne's museum was his first stop. It holds one of the world's best collections of thylacines. If it wasn't for the backroom collections in museums, the thylacine de-extinction project would be inconceivable. On the shelves and in drawers here are precious thylacine specimens from which Pask and his team have been able to extract DNA. Wow. They said give us a sample of every thylacine. And we said, hold on a minute. <laughs> Why don't we figure out which parts work the best? Every one of the cells in here has DNA. Just a question of how degraded that DNA is. Kevin Rowe is a curator of mammals at the museum and is working closely with Pask. So these are the two that we started with sampling different places. This specimen we've sampled in a few ways because we're working to try to optimize the best sources of DNA on the skin. But it's this baby thylacine specimen that has proved the most valuable. So here it is. Yep, this is my favorite specimen of all of the ones that we have here. More than 110 years old, it was preserved decades before the value of DNA was fully understood. It was put into ethanol, which was quite amazingly fortuitous. What that did is it enabled it to preserve the DNA within that specimen really well. And so it's actually the one that enabled us to sequence the entire genome and will be the, the foundation of bringing the thylacine back. But that's just the beginning. How to turn the genome into a living creature is another thing. In 2008, PASC's team had a major breakthrough. In a world first, they succeeded in bringing DNA from an extinct species back to life by inserting a thylacine fragment into a mouse. We brought back a gene we thought was really important for skeletal development, for the, the shape and overall size of the thylacine. And we can tag the gene, blue. So everywhere you see blue here is where you're seeing uh, that piece of thylacine DNA, our Tassie tiger DNA, resurrected and actually functioning in that living animal. Now they face a Herculean challenge, bringing back the whole genome of an extinct thylacine. And that's where this tiny marsupial, known as the fat-tailed dunnut, comes into play. It's amazing to think a little marsupial like this could give birth to a, a Tasmanian tiger. The dunnut is the thylacine's closest living relative. They intend to edit its genome to create a thylacine. They're mostly the same. You know, we're talking 95% plus similarity between those two genomes, but there's 5% of difference. So what we do is we go in and we edit that 5%. Stem cells will be sourced from the dunnart, then edited by Colossal to match the genome of the thylacine. The nucleus of a dunnart egg will be replaced with the nucleus of the engineered stem cell. The resulting embryo will then be implanted into its host. One of the great things about marsupials is they all give birth to tiny, tiny babies. They're about the size of a grain of rice. What that means for us is that even that little mouse-sized fat-tailed dunnart can give birth to a baby Tasmanian tiger, even though it's gonna massively outgrow the mum after birth. These CT scans of rare baby thylacine specimens will then become critical. We can actually map out their developmental trajectory to make sure that that final animal we get is gonna be developing correctly along those pathways. And if it's not? then we would know that we're not recreating the thylacine so we can stop those experiments, go back, have a look at what other bits we can change and then create the next one and have a look at how that one's developing. So really, until it's born, you won't know what you're going to get. The whole goal with this project is to edit that genome to be 99.9% .9 thylacine, but we don't know how big a difference that 0.01% might make, but it will definitely be a thylacine. 
And definitely have stripes. I hope so. <laughs> I feel like we failed if it's not stripey. According to PASC, it will be at least 10 years before a genetically engineered thylacine cell is produced. But Colossal CEO is much less circumspect. We put a very big ambitious goal out there for the mammoth of, you know, five to six years. Uh, and elephants have a 22-month gestation. Uh, given that our, our model organism, the fat-tailed dunnard, has a 14-day gestation, which is obviously significantly shorter, I think that it's safe to assume that we will um, hopefully see one before we see a mammoth. Um, that kind of gives you some idea of time. So possibly in the next five years. I think that's a really good assessment. But at Sydney's Australian Museum, the assessment of the thylacine de-extinction project is far from good. The project is fanciful. I guarantee you that in 10 years from now, that animal will not be running around Tasmania. This is not going to happen. Chris Helgen is a museum's chief scientist. He finds the use of the Dunart farcical. Does that look anything like a thylacine to you? And not just because of the way it looks. It's not closely related to the thylacine. It's about as close as you can get amongst modern species, but the thylacine is so different from all other marsupials that it's in its own family. The question is, could you ever modify the DNA of this animal to get it anything close to becoming this animal? I say absolutely not. It would be something a bit like a dog to a cat, like a horse to a rhino. Could you possibly turn an elephant into a mammoth? Maybe it's just possible because they're so closely related. And we know a lot about the biology of elephants, so we have something to go on. With thylacines, we're missing all of that ground information. And Helgen contends that even if something is produced, it won't be a thylacine. The outcome will be some kind of genetically modified Dunart. That's not a thylacine. It's a pronouncement that doesn't appear to worry colossal CEO. We like to think of it as a proxy species, right? We're not cloning these animals. So what percentage of it is a thylacine versus non-thylacine uh, is still to be determined. Like once we get to our first couple of thylacines, we'll let the world judge and say, you know, can my grandmother look at it and say, wow, it's a thylacine. How close genetically do we really need, right? And so ultimately we want to ensure that we are uh, developing uh, an animal that uh, can serve as the proxy to that degraded ecosystem. Australia's degraded ecosystems are in crisis. Catastrophic bushfires, droughts and massive habitat destruction have had a devastating impact. More species of mammals have been lost than on any other continent, and the country has one of the highest rates of species decline in the world. The thylacine was absolutely critical in balancing the ecosystem from, from which it came. And so a great example of what happens when you lose that predator is with the Tasmanian devils. Another native Australian marsupial, the Tasmanian devil, has long been a signature species for animals on the brink of extinction. A contagious and deadly facial tumour wiping out some 80% of the population. Now, if the Tasmanian tiger was still around, it eats those sick and injured animals and it removes them from the population before they have a chance to spread that disease. So we think that bringing that animal back to Tasmania would have incredible benefits, not just for the Tasmanian devil population, but for all sorts of unforeseen parts of that ecosystem. It's a vision that realistically won't be tested here in Tasmania for decades, only after thylacine proxies are studied thoroughly and deemed safe to release into the wild. About 5,000 thylacines once roamed across Tasmania, but conservationists say that bringing them back is unlikely to restore the environmental imbalance left in the wake of their demise. I think it's a false premise and I think it's, uh, I'll be generous and say I think it's naive. Nick Mooney has spent his life in the Tasmanian wilderness working for the government's Parks and Wildlife Service. By the time this has happened, we'll have so many more extinctions and there'll be fractions of habitat left and the very best of it that the thylacine would have preferred to live in uh, will be well and truly under lock and key, fenced and pastured and all the rest of it, some of it cemented. And as for benefits for the devils he's worked to preserve... They've become very rare. What do you do, put thylacines back in there and suppress them further? And in fact, the disease process is well underway and there's no way you can roll it back. It's got its own momentum, if you like. 
and there's just so many moving parts in this machine now that people are influencing from roadkill and development of all sorts, pesticides and then climate change. The northwest of the island was once prime thylacine habitat, but today one of the last populations of Tasmanian devils not affected by the lethal facial tumour struggles to survive here. Local wildlife volunteer Alice Carson shares photographs of devil roadkill. See, this is a big guy. Big old devil in its prime. Yeah, yep. Yeah, yep. big scarred face. Look at that poor darling. Carson says she's removed more than 160 carcasses of endangered devils from this stretch of road in the past 18 months. We haven't got room for the animals we've got now. We're not prepared to share what we've got now. So I, I, it's not because I don't want thylacines back in the wild. I'd love to see that, but I'd love to see what we've got here protected as well. It makes me think a very expensive lab animal might be just splattered on the road here so, <laughs> shortly after you release it. To have a thylacine rebalance the ecology, it actually has to be there in a lot of numbers throughout the landscape, free ranging. If they succeed, it will be a freak show because the animals will be so valuable there's no way you can let them free range because anything can happen to them and people won't put up with them. Um, you, you still have an animal that people will be worried about their sheep. We're here on the corner of the old Van Diemen's land grant. They put a lot of sheep on here and they actually employed a, a thylacine hunter to try and track down the thylacines and kill them. The extermination of thylacines hangs heavily in the air. For Mooney, it's a sobering reminder of what should never be allowed to happen again. I think we should be preventing extinctions, not trying to resurrect animals, or in fact, invent animals. If we focus on this effort to reconstruct a, uh, an animal, we're gonna teach people that extinction isn't forever, and we can fix everything later, so let's not worry. Let the devils die. Let them die. This uh, project, I think, is a, a very serious distraction for genuine nature conservation. And it's the diversion of investors' funds that concerns the Australian Museum's chief scientist. To spend a lot of money doing something that I think is not just infeasible but impossible is a missed opportunity, I think. If you really wanted to show that de-extinction was possible, you would probably be starting with animals that were much less charismatic. Australia's uh, extinct native rodents or maybe extinct native bandicoots. These are some animals that uh, have very close living relatives uh, and you might have an actual shot at achieving something, but they wouldn't be the charismatic ones that would bring in those tens of millions of dollars of investment. I think that anytime you're pushing the bounds of technology and doing something bold, uh, you know, you're going to have critics, right? You know, what I will tell you is that the world that we live in uh, needs bold solutions. We need genetic rescue tools in order for us to save critically endangered species that exist on, on the planet. 250 kilometres west of Melbourne, Grampians National Park is home to endangered species. Museum Victoria's Kevin Rowe and his team are working to ensure they'll reap the benefits from advances in genetic technology. We've got a smoky mouse. A smoky mouse? It's a smoky mouse in here, yeah. Oh, that's right awesome. Right here in the rocks. The first one for the day. They're collecting tissue from animals like the threatened smoky mouse. So we're hoping this guy is now breeding, um, but in case he doesn't, we've got his genetic diversity preserved as cells for the next 100 to 200 years. Tissue samples containing living DNA are preserved in the museum's biobank at a temperature of less than minus 180 degrees Celsius. Using the preserved DNA, the thylacine project is promising solutions for the more than 30 Australian marsupials under threat of extinction. The reason I love this project is because regardless of the endpoint, the conservation technologies that we develop are going to be transformative for marsupials. We'll have mechanisms of turning biobanked marsupial tissue back into marsupials that we can repopulate areas after a bushfire. We want to bolster their immune system so they can survive diseases better, maybe survive climate change better, maybe able to deal with predators in the environment better. They are things that we absolutely will unequivocally be able to achieve through this project, as well as bringing the thylacine back. 
Spin-off technologies may prove to be the project's greatest achievement, but back in Mole Creek, at least one thylacine lover is barracking for its resurrection. Whether it be one out of the wild or whether it's out of a laboratory, that'd be good to see one, wouldn't it? And then we all know what they were talking about.